to the last one in the session, last but not least. By the way, Matt, you are the only one between us and the break. I see. Uh, so, uh, I want to introduce Matt Austin, not that he needs introduction, but we know one another for scary amount of time. Scary amount of time. <laughs> and it's getting only worse. Uh, so, Matt worked actually eons ago, actually, I think, with uh, Bjarne and Bell Labs. And he also worked at SGI. And he also worked at uh, at Apple yes. on that has an interesting address. I was just thinking when, uh, when we're talking about infinite loops that their address is one infinite loop. So, um, and then nowadays, and he worked at SGI and now he works at Google. It's an interesting career but always in good, uh, in good company. And uh, he, he uh, Work, uh, wrote also a book about SDL, at least I have it, probably many of you have it too, and use it. So uh, today he's going to talk something about large scale distributed computing, uh, parallel stuff. So uh, it's kind of novel, I think, in a different format, but I'm sure very good. So let's work on Matthew.
So that's uh, roughly the kind of computer that we're talking about. That's the kind of programming environment that I work on. Now, um, it's not very easy to program. So uh, what makes it hard to program? Well, there are, one of them is just the complexity of the system. That a uh, single program running on this is not a single process. It's not running on a single CPU. It's a lot of distinct processes working together, interacting with other services. Fault tolerance is absolutely crucial, and the memory hierarchy is not what you're used to. So let's talk about the memory hierarchy first. Um, here are some numbers. These are taken from Urza Louise's book. These are not numbers measured at Google Data Center. I should emphasize that the uh, actual details are uh, somewhat confidential. So how do we get these numbers? This is a uh, fairly simple model of what a warehouse scale computer might look like. So what we're assuming here is we've got 2,000 servers. We're hooking them up. E each one of them has uh, some kind of an ordinary x86 CPU. Each of them has four um, one terabyte um, serial ATA drives. Again, fairly conventional technology. We're hooking them up using Geekbet Ethernet, and we're doing that to find dividing them up into racks of 40, of which uh, on the uh, MAC switches, we have um, eight uplink ports that connect to the uh, cluster switch. And finally, what we're assuming here to get bandwidth is that uh, each of these servers is getting its uh, fair share of network bandwidth when talking off rack. So with all of that said, you can take a look at the numbers here. I'm not sure if you can actually read this, but it said, no, OK. So at the very far left, which uh, isn't actually even on this chart. You can just imagine the uh, Occupy cat. So you've got, uh, say, a few megabytes of Occupy cat. This is uh, what you have in local main memory, local disk, RAM main memory. That is main memory of all of the uh, servers on the same rack. Um, disk for all the servers on the same rack. Um, main memory for There, you, you couldn't read the bottom, you probably can't read the top. The blue line is latency in microseconds, the uh, red line is bandwidth in megabytes per second, and the green line is that uh, capacity of gigabytes. So, and this is a logarithmic scale. I guess you probably can't read this either. This goes all the way from 0 0.1 to uh, 10 million at once to stop there. So, at the uh, very far left, the part that I can show, just as an example of capacity, uh, cache might be a few megabytes. At the very far right, capacity for a disk in the entire cluster, that might be something on the order of 10 petabytes using the uh, numbers that I gave. Well, just, just do that back of the envelope calculation. 2,000 systems, 8 terabytes disk for each. Uh, none, of, none of that is uh, really terribly exotic. So this is a, this is a very deep hierarchy getting access from uh, your program to something on the far right is much more expensive than something on the far left. All of the problems that you normally have with memory, memory hierarchy are uh, magnified here. And fault tolerance, that's the other way in which uh, scaling in this environment is very different from scaling in the kind of environment that Damien was talking about in the last talk. So again, let's just do a really simple back of the envelope calculation. We've got these, uh, thousands of servers that we're hooking together to form a single unified system. Let's suppose that each of these systems is ultra-reliable, and ultra-reliable might mean mean time between failures of uh, 30 years for a single one of these systems. Well, that means that your uh, entire warehouse scale computer is not very reliable because 30 years is 10,000 days, which means that on average you're going to have one server dying per day. So, um, you're running Gmail, say, on one of these things, you do not want email to die once a day. <laughs> so um, you have to design your system then so that having a single computer fail is not fail. That's, there's just no way that you can get around that by making your individual systems more reliable. And then once you have done even that trivial back of the envelope calculation, you realize that, uh, in fact, failures are even more fact of life than you think for that that uh, mean time between failures of 30 years is extremely unrealistic. In the real world, if you've got a typical 
This drives the uh, annualized failure rate is somewhere between 2 and 4 percent. Numbers vary depending on who does the measurement. And uh, other times it's hardware failures, and you sometimes have to take parts of the system down for maintenance. And then uh, some of the failures are just due to bugs. You, uh, operating system kernels crash and decay again. So in fact, we get many more than one, one uh, server failure per day. Failures are absolutely common. The system has to be designed to be able to uh, accommodate that. And it turns out you don't necessarily even want your failures to be all that rare. Once you've got a system that can tolerate failure, then um, you start having a lot of interesting design decisions to make. You uh, can buy systems with various levels. We can, you can buy components with various levels of reliability at various different price points, and this just becomes an economic calculation that what kind of uh, reliability and price trade-off is there for you. It, uh, Netflix is reporting the fact that um, they make a practice of uh, having a process that goes around randomly killing other processes. because. Uh, now, there is, a, there is a reason for that. It's because they know that failures are going to happen, and they don't want them to be too rare, because if something is extremely rare, then it might not show up in uh, testing. If they make sure that deaths are um, absolutely predictable, then they can be sure that the code paths that handle them are going to be exercised. So that's, uh, again, one of the kinds of trade-offs that you can make for some of this. And once you have a uh, system like this, it comes with its own sort of a software stack. At the very bottom level, you have the uh, traditional parts of the OS that are running on uh, each of the computers, the uh, kernel, the disk drivers, what have you. Then you have what's uh, essentially the operating system and for the uh, system as a whole, instead of for each machine at a time. I described earlier that uh, on a system like this, it's very typical for you to have a disk drive on each of the servers that make up the cluster. Well, that very rapidly implies that you've got some kind of a distributed storage system that you're dealing with, because you want to make sure that you can get data from uh, other systems, not just from the one that your uh, process happens to be running on. And you want to make sure that the death of a single disk drive isn't going to result in any data loss. So you need some kind of distribution, some kind of replication, for data. At Google, we have uh, GFS as uh, one of our file systems. There are other similar distributed file systems elsewhere. You need some kind of a scheduler to, to decide which tasks are running on which servers. It looks a lot like an operating system, but on a uh, larger than machine scale. Above that is the application layer. And uh, usually, you're going to want some kind of a framework sitting below the application layer that handles all of these uh, complexities that make a system like this hard to program. That's primarily what I'm going to be talking about, the uh, framework that's going to be sitting underneath the uh, application <coughs> layer that uh, abstracts some of the difficult tasks like distribution, replication, fault tolerance, handling slow workers. Those problems come up again and again, and we do not want every application programmer to reinvent them. Uh, there are many such frameworks. I, these, these ones are all ones that came out of Google. These are ones that we have all published on. If you uh, look them up, you'll find the publications. I, I could equally well have uh, come up with frameworks like this that other companies have published on. I could have mentioned Microsoft's Dryad, for example. I could have mentioned uh, Amazon's Dynamo. I imagine that every company that has uh, these kinds of systems either um, uses or reinvents these kinds of problems. So the one that I listed at the top is uh, MapReduce. That's the uh, first of these systems that uh, Google published on. It's the one that's still used for uh, many of our problems. It's a very simple model, but a very flexible one. So I'm going to uh, talk mostly about that. If I have any time, which is possible, then I'll uh, also get to Cradle so that I can explain what my shirt means. And, uh, so let, let's start with MapReduce. A lot of you have probably seen MapReduce already, but uh, I suspect that many of you have not. So uh, I'm going to go over what it is and how it handles some of the uh, difficult problems that uh, we 
we're dealing with with computation at this scale. So at the basic level, MapReduce is exactly what it sounds like from the name, map and then reduce. If you've done any functional programming, then uh, that comes as no surprise at all. Works in two phases. The user uh, supplies two functions, uh, a map function. It takes a uh, key value pair, emits a list of key value pairs. Not necessarily the same type. We uh, then take the intermediate data. We collect them uh, organized by key so that all of the uh, pairs with the same intermediate key are grouped together. Then you run a, a reduce operation on that single, uh, on that list, all of the items of which have the same key. You emit some item, and that's the output of the computation as well. Uh, as well. So a few things to notice about this. One of them is that uh, it can operate on uh, inputs and outputs of arbitrary type, arbitrary format. All that it really requires is that you'll be able to interpret the input as a uh, series of key value pairs, and that you'll be able to somehow force the output into that form. That's uh, very general. You can interpret almost anything as key value pairs. Another thing to notice is that uh, both of these phases are very parallelizable. You can take the input and split it into as many chunks as you like, divide that up into arbitrary tasks that you form out to machines. And the third thing to notice is that although I said that this happens in two phases, and although the user only uh, supplies two functions, a map function and a reduce function, there's really a third phase that occurs in the middle that isn't mentioned here, the shuffle phase. That's where we actually do the grouping of uh, the intermediate values, <coughs> grouping them by uh, the key. So I can uh, show you the classic example. This is from the very first uh, member newspaper by Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemelmott. This is the uh, example that everybody uses. It, again, not, isn't necessarily the smartest example in the world of how to use MapReduce. It's very traditional, though, and it's, well, it's not as bad as exponential time terminology anyway. <laughs> so in, the, in this example, we're um, counting the number of words. We're, we're counting the number of times each word occurs in a series of documents. You can imagine that's actually something you might want to do, at least if you generalize it a little bit. You have a series of documents. Each consists of a series of words. So for the map function, you uh, get some kind of a document ID. You get the document itself. You parse the document using whatever technique you need, turning it just into a bag of words. For each word, you emit the intermediate value of the word itself and the number one, because each time you see it, you're seeing its count once. Then in the reduce function, you call that reduce function once for um, each word that appears in the input for each one, the values are just a series of ones. You sum them up, that's your final result you output it. Simple enough, there are various refinements that you could make here. Uh, some of the refinements may even be implicit in the code, but uh, not really terribly important for uh, the moment. So we can run through a simple example showing how that works. I'm going to run through it pretty quickly because it's um, reasonably obvious. Um, Given what I said, uh, feel free to stop me or slow me down if uh, it's not, but uh, I, th I think it should be pretty clear how uh, the word count is uh, working in this example. So, um, very simple, map and reduce just for functional programming. If you were just writing that model, it would be uh, maybe a dozen or two lines in your favorite functional language, at least a dozen or two if you're feeling verbose. Uh, the actual implementation is much more complicated than that because the whole point of this is to handle data distribution, parallelism of fault tolerance. So what we do in the uh, real MapReduce implementation that we use, we have a master machine that uh, controls the computation as a whole. It looks at the uh, specification of the input data, which might be something like a uh, series of files um, stored on GFS divides that into a series of chunks. The uh, number of chunks is typically much larger than the series of, uh, than the number of machines that we have working on this. That's uh, important for load balancing. And then it starts doling out work to the uh, input machines that do the map uh, part of the uh, computation. 
a little bit at a time to make sure that if some machines are going through their chunks much faster than others, that uh, they're able to get some of the undone work. We uh, produce the uh, intermediate key value pairs, which we store then somewhere, typically, for example, on the map machines. And then we uh, have the shuffle and the reduce running concurrently on the same machines. They uh, look at the uh, appropriate intermediate keys for uh, <coughs> this particular uh, chunk of reduce work perform, uh, do their set of sorting, run the reduce operation, and uh, then finally write the output. The output then is written as a uh, series of files, not just a single file. Uh, I guess actually one other thing that I forgot to say is uh, the way that we know which uh, intermediate values go with uh, onto which of the uh, reduced workers. We typically um, use sharding by uh, hashing the intermediate key and then modding it with uh, some appropriate number of with, with whatever the number of um, reduced charts is, so that each one gets uh, just the ones that belong to it. Well. That's uh, a little bit of a whirlwind um, discussion of the map reduce architecture, but uh, let's see any action now. This is one of the things that the uh, system provides is uh, status monitoring. So this is an example of a graph that you might see on the uh, map reduce master machine showing the uh, progress. Not sure if you can see all of the numbers up there. But at this point, the uh, green that you're seeing on the graph here means that the map phase is active. No other part of the computation is active. It shows up there what the uh, input size is. It doesn't know any of the sizes of the intermediate data yet because it doesn't have enough of them. But the input is about uh, 878 uh, gigabytes. So we continue. There's, there's some more monitoring numbers here. We're starting to see more of the map work. Dot the red means that we're starting on some of the shuffle phase. Now the blue starts, we're starting to see the uh, reduce phase go. These uh, graphs here are showing which reduce chart is active, and you'll see that some of them are already done now, some of them are mostly done. Now we're almost done, but not quite, and there's still one reduce chart active here, you may or may not be able to see that little bit of red up there near the uh, upper right hand corner. But you can notice a few things. One is, uh, if you can read that all the way, the back of this computation has been going for 40 minutes. There has been one worker death, but things just proceeded anyway. You will also see that uh, for the last few minutes, all but one uh, reduced chart has been uh, completed. The entire progress of the computation has been uh, waiting on that one last straggler, and uh, that's, that's a crucial observation for making this work reasonably. So uh, how does this head fall to all rest? Well, first of all, one of the jobs of the master is to uh, periodically ping all of the workers, see whether all of them are still healthy. If any of them um, are either dead or can't be reached by the master, which is uh, basically as good as dead for the purposes of this computation, then the master takes uh, appropriate corrective action, spawning new jobs, perhaps doling out some of the work that uh, the uh, dead workers have been going, had been uh, working on. And to handle the straggler problem, where the entire computation might be held up just by one or two small workers, the master will sometimes uh, launch a backup shard, which means that even though something is uh, already working on a particular part of the computation, the master will uh, preemptively launch another task that handles that same part, and whichever one of them finishes first does an atomic commit so that uh, we don't ever get uh, confused results. If you uh, look at Jeff and Sanchez's paper, one of the things they will say is that uh, by using an intelligent choice of when to launch backup workers, you can get about a 40% performance improvement for using maybe 1% or 2% more resources. So uh, an excellent trade-off. All right. Well, I think I have about two minutes to say a little bit about uh, one of the other frameworks that we're using. This is uh, a little bit more specialized than MapReduce. It's used for large-scale graph computation. And you can imagine why graph algorithms might be important to Google. Uh, the company was actually founded on a graph algorithm, PageRank. 
but uh, we do other important algorithms. Two, we have the social graph, we have uh, various geographic graphs, and so here I'm going to walk very quickly through uh, how the uh, Pareto framework works on uh, the simplest real graph algorithm that you might imagine, uh, single source shortest paths. So we've got the source there is marked with a distance of zero from itself. Every other vertex there is marked with infinity, because we don't know. So imagine the highest degree of parallelism that you might have. Every vertex is uh, operating independent. The source vertex starts. It has access just to its own data, so it sends a message to all of its uh, out neighbors saying, here's a proposed distance for you. Next iteration, those vertices become active. They now have a distance that they can report to their neighbors. We continue. Every time a vertex has an improved distance, um, it becomes active. It starts sending messages. Eventually, we assess, and we know the uh, distances to every other vertex in the graph. Again, the game here is we want to distribute the graph between many of the machines in the cluster. We want to be able to uh, handle failures, but we want to present to the user a uh, relatively straightforward API so that they don't have to worry about that. In this case, this is the sort of thing that a user would write to describe what computation they want to perform. And the essential thing about this is the user says what happens at one vertex using purely local data in a single round of iteration. The framework then applies that and uh, builds it into an algorithm that uh, operates on the entire graph. All right, I think I am not going to try to go through the details of fault tolerance here, so I'm just going to leave you with reading assignment and <laughs> leave you with uh, about uh, one minute for questions if, uh, if you have any. Yes? So in terms of uh, automated AI, it looks like rather than not produce, it, it would be interchangeable. Is that true or is there anything special you do for insights? Um, is, is it true that the uh, Pringle and the MapReduce APIs could be interchangeable? Um, I wouldn't say that APIs are directly inter... Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean APIs. I, I meant the internal. Ah, the internal implementation. Yes, the APIs are certainly very different. The internal implementations could be um, fairly similar. There are certainly components that one could imagine sharing between them. Um, both of them have... Uh, Similar communication patterns in the um, MapReduce implementation. It's basically a complete bipartite graph on the workers in the Pringle implementation. It's a uh, complete graph. Both of them have an operation that looks very much like a shuffle. The main difference is that MapReduce is essentially stateless. The entire output of the uh, map workers is passed on to the reduced workers in an uh, intermediate in the intermediate key value pairs. In the case of Pringle, it is not stateless because uh, each of the uh, workers is generating messages sent to other vertices, and it's also affecting the state of the uh, vertices stored in uh, that portion of the graph. So it's the stateful versus stateless that's the uh, largest change in the implementation. And although I really didn't have time to get to it, you can imagine that that creates a huge difference when it comes to the fault tolerance properties of the two <coughs> systems. Fault tolerance is much easier to achieve in a stateless system than in a stateful one. Yes? Yes. Um, there are two answers to that. If you look at uh, Jeff and Sanjay's original paper, you will. Uh, see that, uh, well, they actually give two answers. So the first answer they gave is that the master has a uh, fairly small amount of data. It's just one machine. So it basically is just uh, keeping track of which work has been assigned to which work or which fraction of the work has been completed. So you would easily imagine um, checkpointing all of that data periodically and then having a new master process uh, coming up, reading through the checkpoint log and starting off where the uh, first one died. The second answer to that question is that uh, th this is so, a little bit like the uh, birthday paradox thing, that uh, the chance that anyone, that 
A machine is going to fail during the course of a computation is extremely high. The chance that a particular machine is going to fail during the course of a computation is much lower. So although, even, even if you don't have cat pointing, although the cost of a master failure is uh, much higher than the cost of a worker failure, the probability is much lower because its master is just a single machine. So at least the uh, initial implementation of MapReduce uh, did not do anything special about master failure. Yes? Uh, so you're talking about warehouse scale computing. If I put a warehouse scale computer, should I be thinking in terms of running a single warehouse scale program in it, or many people running many warehouse scale programs on that same warehouse computer? You could think about it either way. In practice, I believe that the latter is much more common because uh, if you are a company with the resources to uh, use a computer like this, you probably have more things, more than one thing that you want to do. And it probably would not be efficient to uh, build a separate data center for uh, every program that you want to run. And I would partition that data center to say this is more, into multiple smaller computers you could distribute out. You could do that. That that gets a little bit to the question of uh, what kind of a system level um, scheduler you have. The uh, you could think of that either statically or dynamically. In practice, I imagine it would usually be most efficient to do it dynamically, since uh, if you partition it into uh, separate chunks in too static a way, you're going to find fragmentation where some of them are oversubscribed and some of them are empty. Yeah. Does the master slave model? It, um, well, does it present a bottleneck? The answer, of course, is yes, because there's going to be some level of scaling where um, a single master can't handle uh, uh, too many workers. That level is uh, rather high, though, so um, in practice, you can uh, scale. In practice, with uh, enough cleverness in uh, how you program the master and how you uh, handle uh, communication with the workers, uh, you, a single master is sufficient for many purposes. Not all, but many. But yes, in some cases, you do want to have a distributed master. All right, I think that uh, it's probably time for cookies now, isn't it? Oh.